Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining the ladies of Sister to Sister as we address the last words that Jesus spoke from the cross. We won't say they were his final words because we know that he was resurrected and spoke again. But today we are looking at those words that he spoke and we know that there's so much power and, and intentionality in the words that he was spoken because Jesus literally as he was on the cross was clinging to life and took time to share these words. In John 10 and 18, we see Jesus saying that no one takes my life. I lay it down. I have authority, he said, to lay it down and to pick it back up again. And so literally he was using his authority over life as he was hanging there in pain to share these words with us. And these are not things that we only need to consider um, their impact at resurrection time or at Easter time, but literally these are life-giving words that we can apply daily to our walk. And so we just wanna take some time to look at each of the things that Jesus spoke. We have sisters that are joining us from various places to share. Some may come with a sermon, some may come with a conversation in whatever form or manner that um, we come in. Our prayer is that you will be encouraged, that you will be empowered, and that you would feel embraced by our loving Lord and Savior. So first, we're going to kick off with Pastor Helen Salim L, and she is going to talk to us about his approach, about Jesus's approach to the cross. Listen in. I thank you for this opportunity that has been given in Jesus' name. Amen. Approaching the cross. Good Friday is a solemn day for the Christians um, on our Christian calendar because it's meant to commemorate the passion, the suffering, and the death of Jesus Christ. He was crucified on a cross position outside Jerusalem at a place called Golgotha. Crucifixion was a form of torture and execution used in the ancient world. It involved binding a person to a wooden post or tree using, in fact, a rope or a nail. The Jewish historian Josephus viewed crucifixion as the most wretched of death. And when you read about it, you know, even though it talks about it actually in the Bible, when someone gives you a description of it, you can just kind of in your mind imagine, and it causes you to feel some pain inside when you think about what he went through for us. Because of the long drawn out suffering, horrible manner of execution, it was viewed as a supreme penalty by the Romans. When we usually speak of Good Friday, we remember that it's written about uh, with the agony that Jesus went through, being spit on, being tortured, being mocked, being stripped of his clothing and having a scarlet robe put on him as they mocked him, having that crown of thorns placed on his head. When we speak of the words that he said, we always have the seven last sayings of Jesus on the cross. And so we talk about um, how he was hanging on the cross, crucified between two criminals and how he asked for forgiveness for his torturers and how he was comforting one of the criminals and he crying out to his father and we uh, always talk about how he gave uh, credence to his mother and to uh, uh, John, you know, bringing that relationship together, proclaiming his thirst and fulfillment of Psalm 69, 21, declaring the completion of his work when he said it is finished, and then commending himself into God's hands. But before Christ willingly placed himself on the cross, he had to approach the cross. Jesus was always on the way to the cross. The cross is always his goal. We have to remember that he was flesh. Now, don't forget that he was flesh. It tells us in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Then when we drop down to verse 14, it tells us that, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, which lets us know that the word, which was God, was became, became flesh. So we know that the word, which is God, became flesh, and so he was incarnate, which means that uh, the word was in human form, and the word was the only son of the father. 
So one cannot look at Jesus and say, well, he was able to approach the cross. He was able to do this because after all, he was the Messiah. We have to remember that he was also like this flesh. He had everything that we have currently. So I want to take a look at the journey as he approached the cross. First, we have the celebration of the king, a king. There was a triumphant entry into Jerusalem, and all the gospels mentioned this. They talked about how the people were fanfaring and saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, and how he came in riding on this donkey, and how they threw out their cloaks on the, for him to go over, and also they put out all these palm uh, leaves, these trees from the branches. They, the branches from the tree, they put, they put all this out. They were like, hallelujah, glory to God, you know, for his being there when he came in. At that moment, it looked to the world as if their king had arrived in force to claim his rightful throne. Second, though, we have the humiliation, the humility of a servant. Here we have him at the last summer in John chapter 13, the night before he was crucified, the night before he was going to die. And he was going to be betrayed by Judas, and he was going to be beaten, made fun of, and nailed to a cross. But listen to what Jesus did. It talks about this in John chapter 13. It said, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. This is what he did knowing what was going to happen to him. And even knowing that he was going to wash the feet of those who were going to leave him, one was going to betray him, one was going to deny him. He knew this. But yet the Bible said the night before that he rose from supper, laid aside his own garments, took a towel, girded himself, poured water, washed the disciples' feet. All of this he knew, he did when he knew what was going to happen to him. All this he did when he was aware of everything that was going to take place. If it had been us, we would not have been at ease sitting there with some people that we knew were going to do something to us. We would not have been having this time of merriment at this time. And we definitely would not have washed anybody's feet. We definitely would not have humbled ourselves in any kind of way. We never would have initiated the act of a servant. Third, we have to we have the sorrow of a request that was denied. I think this is for me is part of the saddest part, because in Matthew chapter 26, he goes to a Gethsemane with his disciples, and he took Peter, the disciples with him, but he took Peter and John and James aside and told them to stay there while he, while he prayed. And he when he cried out to his father, the Bible says that he said uh, in Matthew 26, 38, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He said, my soul is. He didn't go into it excited about what is gonna happen. He said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. Then in John chapter 12, verse 27, we see another expression of agony, but we also see a determination to do the will of God. For it says, now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I came to this hour. He did say, first of all, my soul is troubled. He did say, well, should I just ask the Father to remove me from this hour? But he also said, but for this purpose I came to this hour. Jesus prayed to God three times for the cup of wrath to pass from him. Then he declared it was not his will, but that God's will had to be done. But in Luke's account, I want us to notice something about the prayer in Luke's account. The Bible says, and being in agony, deeply distressed and anguish, almost to the point of death, he prayed more intently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down on the ground. He prayed more intently to the point that his sweat became like drops of blood. This was the agony that he was going through. And what that taught me was that a lot of times when God has something for us to do and something that we don't want to do, number one, is something that's unpleasant. It's okay to be in agony. 
it's okay to kind of wonder about it and, you know, not really be all happy and excited about it. Sometimes when, as Christians, other people will say, well, uh, you know, you just do what God wants you to do. And you're like, but this is hurting me. This is something that he wants me to do. It's unpleasant. It's good for me to do, but it's something unpleasant for me to do. And so I like to see in the fact that Jesus did at least was in agony and pray more intently because most time we get to the chapter that said, we just said, not my will, but thy will be done. We cut it at that. But I think we need to go into looking more at the fact that he was in agony over this. This wasn't a pleasantry thing that he wanted to do, but he knew he had to do it. Third thing about his uh, approach to the cross was it was loneliness. Yes, the disciples traveled with him, but as he approached the cross, he was betrayed by Judas. And then we read in Matthew chapter 26, verses 55 and 56, we read this about when Judas came to him with the crowd, and the crowd came with swords and clubs. And it says in 55, in that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? He said, I said daily with you, teaching in a temple, and you did not seize me. But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. This last line. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. Not only went away from him and left him alone, but they ran away from him in an incentive manner, like cowering sheep, the shepherd being uh, about to be smitten. There were those whom he had called. These are those whom he had called. These are those who him sent for as his apostles. These are those who have been with him and watched him heal. These are those who have heard him preach. These are those who have been with him from the very beginning. They knew him. Yet at this time, they left. The Bible says that they forsook him, abandoned him, and they fled. And if that wasn't enough, Peter. Peter would previously boldly announced that even if he must die with Christ, he said he would never deny him. And Jesus told him, you, you're going to deny me three times. Three times you're going to do that. Approaching the cross, there was loneliness. The journey to the cross was difficult. In Matthew's account, Matthew chapter 12, verse 22 to 24, Jesus healed a man who was blind and mute. The people who witnessed this, they were amazed at it. And they said, can this be the son of David? But the religious people, the Pharisees, insisted that Jesus was in partnership with Beelzebub, the prince of demons. And I find this amusing. I find this really insulting, though, to, that he was a prince of peace approaching the cross to bring deliverance, and yet he was being accused of being in covenant with the prince of demons. Jesus approached the cross with knowledge. The cross was not an accident. The cross was not a good plan that had gone wrong. The cross was his destiny. That's why we see in the Bible three times that he explained to his disciples that this is what was going to happen to him. He approached the cross with authority. In John chapter 19, we have this exchange between Jesus and Pilate. Pilate took Jesus back into the headquarters and asked him, where are you from? But Jesus gave no answer. Pilate demanded, why don't you talk to me? Then he said these words, don't you realize that I have the power to release you or crucify you. Now Jesus speaks. He says, you would have no power over me at all unless it were given to you from above. So the one who handed me over to you has the greatest sin. Jesus was not afraid to indicate to Pilate that he had no power, no power to claim. Pilate had just as much power as was given to him and his ability extended no farther. God had ordered his life his circumstances, and the extent of his dominion. This was the reproof of a, pow a powerful man who thought that his power was only in himself. He was so proud in his office. He was forgetful of the great source of his authority and, was and who supposed that by his own talents and his own fortune, he had risen to this present place. How many officers today have not realized that God is the one who gave them their place? How many today do not realize that think that it's owing to their own talents or their own merits that they've ridden to such an elevation. We must all realize it's God who gives us what we have. We cannot boast beyond what has been given to us. Pilate's words are true in the most legalistic way. 
he could choose to have Jesus execute or release. But Jesus was not intimidated by Pilate's words. The ultimate cause of the events were not Pilate's, nor was Pilate's power. It was and had always been God's will, just like it is with all of us. The approach to the cross was a difficult and a very lonely journey, but it was necessary. Only Christ could make the journey. Only he could walk that road and drink that cup that the Father had given him to drink. Only he could do it. One writer even said, and I quote, Christ was uniquely called, uniquely anointed, and uniquely qualified to suffer, to die, and rise again for our deliverance from sin's hold on us, end of quote. To God be the glory that Jesus Christ was able to approach the Christ. Be blessed. Thank you so much for joining in with us and listening as we, um, as Pastor Peaches, Pastor Helen talked to us about Jesus' approach to the cross. There we saw his humanity um, shining through. And sometimes we, we only think about Jesus in form of, you know, him being from the Father and him walking in the Spirit. And we know that's true. But he was also a man. And so as he approached the cross, we saw his humanity. And then once he was on the cross, we began to examine the things that he said. And the first statement that he made was, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And our sister Grace, Minister Grace Trombone, is going to share with us on that word. Thank you. Hello, my sister to sister family. This is Grace Trumbo. And I wanted to come to you with one of the seven sayings of Christ. Um, I chose the one uh, that talked about uh, forgiveness, which is Luke 23, 24, where it says, Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so I chose that one because I want to concentrate on forgiveness. I want to do a, a concentrate on forgiveness. Um, we see that basically Jesus came, uh, was crucified rather. He was being crucified, but they had already whipped him, beat him. Uh, and then they hung him up on this cross. They put the crown of thorns on his head. They uh, spit, spit on him and uh, called him all kind of names, said, come down if you're, you know, if you're the Christ. So they did all of this in order uh, to, to not get him to go to the cross. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Uh, I, that's amazing to me that he was being tortured in, unto death. And his last, one of his last words was, Father, forgive them for they know what, not what they do. Amazing. Um, how many times have we uh, had to be forgiven for things we didn't, we didn't know we did? Or vice versa, how many times uh, did we have to forgive people who, you know, they didn't know what they did, they didn't know what they did wrong, but we had to uh, basically forgive them. And I look at the scripture in Matthew 18, 22, where it talks about Peter, he's asking, uh, Jesus about forgiveness. He's like, how many times do I need to forgive? Uh, seven times seven? And Jesus is like, no, not seven times seven. Try 70 times seven. So I, and so I see that forgiveness is continual. It's, it's not just a one-time thing and you're done. It's a continual thing forgive, to forgive others. Uh, constantly we need to forgive to have our hearts pure. Also, we see Stephen being stoned. Uh, he, they drug him out of the city, stoned him to death. But his last words was, Father, don't, don't lay their sin to, this, to their charge. So basically, Father, forgive them because they don't know what to do. So I realized that forgiveness is awfully important. It's awfully important to the believer. Uh, even when people have wronged you, 
Um, and, you know, they sometimes they don't care. They, they wrong you, they don't care. We still have to be in a posture of forgiveness. We still have to be in that posture of forgiveness. Asking God not to punish them, but to forgive them. Uh, some scriptures I wanted to leave with you. Uh, Ephesians 4 and 32. It tells us, And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sakes, has forgiven you. Corinthians 3, 13. Forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against you, even as Christ forgave, gave you, so also do ye. So you got to forgive. Luke 6, 37, in that last phrase, it says, forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Also in Mark eleven twenty five, and when you stand praying, forgive. If ye have an aunt against any, that your father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses or your sins. So basically, even if somebody has done you wrong, before you go and you ask God for anything, you need to leave your gift at the altar, go to them, ask for forgiveness, and then you're able to come, you know, come to the Father with your request. So forgiveness is continual, continual, because there's so many times that you will, you will do something or somebody else will do something to you that needs forgiveness and you know how we always say what would jesus do well he showed us as he was dying on the cross not he gave us that example he said father forgive them for they do not know what they do so if he can do it so can we thank you Wow. <laughs> Thank you so much, Minister Grace Trombone, for sharing that. We see from that that forgiveness is key, that the first thing that Jesus did, the first thing that he said on the cross was a word regarding forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Definitely words that we can live by. 365 days of the year, walking in forgiveness. Amen. And next, the next thing that was spoken by Jesus was today, you will be with me in paradise. And our sister, Minister Rhonda Joseph, will be talking to us from that point. Check it out. You will be blessed. The second cry from the cross. Amen. Truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Let us begin with the word of prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this day, God, for truly this is the day that you have made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it, Father. Lord, right now, we just ask, Father, that you would just move me out of the way, God, that you would just rise up, God, that the spirit of the living God would fall fresh on me, God. Open my mouth, God, to speak the words that you've given me on this day for your people, God. Lord, we thank you for this day, God, all that you've done and all that you shall do. It's in Jesus' name that we ask and pray. And the people of God said, amen and amen. I'm coming to you with the second cry from the cross coming from Luke, the 23rd chapter, verses 39 through 43. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. And the word of God reads, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Amen. And the word of God is already blessed. And just for a little while, we're going to talk about these two thieves that hung on the cross on each side of Jesus. 
Amen. They were, they were two criminals who had both been sentenced to death. And this is going to be the focus of our message on tonight. Amen. Two men equally close to death. Two men equally close to Christ. Yet one rejects him and the other one repents. And I want to just touch on the first one for a little while. But I want to concentrate on the second thief. Amen. And the lessons that we can learn when all hope seems to be lost. And that's the title of the subject on tonight. What to do when you're losing hope or that you've already lost hope. Amen. What to do when you're losing or have already lost hope. And so the first thief we see, he was just like all the others that looked on at the foot of the cross that day. He questioned the identity of Jesus. Both thieves had a choice to make. Both could have been saved, but this man, unlike his thieving buddy, missed the opportunity of a lifetime. This man did exactly as Job's wife had encouraged him to do, cursed God and died. First, the first thief had a request, save yourself and save us. He wanted to keep doing what he had been doing. He had some unfinished business. He wanted to be given another chance to live his wife, his life, his way. And some of us act just like this thief. We feel like we've been locked up and sentenced to death um, during this virus. Amen. Ever since the virus, this pandemic started, we aren't able to do the things that we used to do. Some of us feel like we've been put on hold. Amen. That this pandemic has put a hold on some of our extracurricular activities. They haven't been able to club like they used to club. Haven't been able to run the streets and creep like you used to creep. They haven't been able to go to the gambling boat like you used to or hang with your drinking and smoking buddies. You can't wait for things to open back up so you can get back out there. They've had enough family time. They're ready to get back out. But enough about the first thief. Let's talk about the second one. The second thief, unlike the first one, this man knew that even in all the wrong he had done, he didn't have to go out like the other one would. Even though they had both lived questionable lives and did things that they should not have done, they had caused pain to others, they had both made poor choices, they both found themselves in a place of pain and without hope. This man knew that even though his situation looked hopeless, it wasn't the end. No, not yet. And just for a few minutes, I want to talk to you about what do you do when you've lost hope or that you feel like you're losing hope. In verse 40 of the word, we find that the second thief was asking, don't you fear God? Which brings me to my first point. When you've lost hope, recognize that God is near. Even with his criminal mind itself, he had the sense to know that he was in the presence of the Messiah. He saw the hung that hung above the cross that said King of the Jews, and he believed he believed at a time when everyone else, including the disciples, were doubting. God knows you've made mistakes, hung around the wrong people, done things you know you shouldn't have been doing. You've lied, you've cheated, you stole, you fornicated, committed adultery, you gossiped, you manipulated, you schemed, you slept with people who you knew were married or belonged to someone else. Yep, you. And even through all of that, You've got to stop and recognize that God is right there and ever-present help in the time of trouble. The King of Kings is omnipresent and right there in the midst of your situation. Psalm 139 and 8 tells us, If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in, he in hell, behold, thou art there. Romans 8, 35 through 39 tells us, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ. I'm sorry, we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor debt, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yes, the people know that you've done what you've done, 
and are ready to hang you or throw you to the wolves. But God, he will never leave you, nor will he forsake you. You've got to trust he is who he says he is. He showed up for Daniel and the lions then. He showed up for the three Hebrew boys. He showed up for Lazarus in the grave. He showed up with, for the woman with the issue of blood. He showed up for the woman at the well. He showed up for the blind man and the widow woman. He showed up for the cre for the thief on the cross. You've got to know even in your messed up situation, he'll show up for you because you've got to recognize that God is near. Even when you're feeling hope hopeless, you've got to know that God is near. Not only do you need to recognize that he's near, but secondly, you've got to repent of your sins. This man, the second thief, confessed for being a sinner. He was truly repentant and acknowledged his need for a savior. He acknowledged that Jesus was innocent and would reign as king. Verse 41 tells us, he says, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Even in all the bad or wrong you've done, you can be forgiven if you ask. If you still have breath in your body, it's not too late to get it right. It's not too late to cry out to God. It's not too late to repent. It's not too late to ask for forgiveness. Second Peter 3 and 9 says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's time to get right, church, and let's go home. This pandemic has showed us that you can be here today and gone today. So many of us have gone through so much this year. We've lost family members. We've lost jobs. We've lost homes and cars. We've drained our bank accounts. And our 401k has been depleted. We've been diagnosed with sickness and disease. But yet we'll still, we'll, we are still here. God has a plan for us. Jeremiah 29 and 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Let the joy of the Lord be your strength on tonight. So even when you're losing hope or you feel like all hope is gone, recognize that God is near. Repent of your sins and thirdly, receive God's grace. In verse 42, it says, The second thief said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Remember me, he said. I know I haven't got it right all the time, not even most of the time, Lord, but I'm asking that you remember me. He humbled himself and was asking for forgiveness for Jesus to remember him. We might twist our mouths and wonder how can he even think to ask God, um, to forgive him, amen, to remember him. But we may not have been a thief like him, but surely the word says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The thief asked to be remembered and we ought to be asking God to remember us on today. He was on this earth, but yet he desired to be in the kingdom of God. Matthew 6 and 33 says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added. Amen. The second thief was seeking those things which were above. He knew that the world would pass away. Amen. We've got to know that Jesus didn't even respond to the first thief. Amen. He only responded to the second thief. Sometimes you can't get caught up with the naysayers and what they're saying and thinking. Amen. Don't even give them the time of day. Jesus responded to the second man, the second thief, and he let him know today that you will be with me in paradise. Today, I can fix your worries. Today, I can stop the pain. Today, I can shut the mouth of the naysayers. Today, I can meet you right where you are. Today, I can turn your mess into a message. Amen. He let him know today that you will be the head and not the tail. I know what you've been doing. Amen. But know that God's grace is sufficient. No matter what you've gone through in this life, Know that there is still hope. It doesn't matter what your bank account looks like. It doesn't matter what they've said about you. It doesn't matter what the doctor has said. Whose report will you believe? God is able to turn it around. He's able to give it all back. Amen. He's able to make a way out of no way. He's able to turn your situation around. Joel 2.25 says, and I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. The Lord is saying, I can give it all back. No matter what you're going through, you can be 
with hope today. Don't be without hope. Cheer up, my brother. Cheer up, my sister. Recognize that God is near. Repent of your sins and receive God's grace and mercy today. The best is yet to come. The same God that talked to the thief on the cross wasn't killed. He gave up the ghost. He went to the grave, but he got up three days later with all power in his hand. You can have hope today that we serve a true and living God, and there is hope for tomorrow. Amen. You be blessed on today. Amen. Keep your head up. Get up. This is Resurrection Week. Amen. And God has something in store for you. Be encouraged, my sister. Be encouraged, my brother. God bless. All righty. That is so awesome that like literally when you stop and think about that Jesus showed us the picture, all of us, as, as Minister Joseph said, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God in some way, but that in his grace and mercy, he has given us the opportunity to be with him in paradise. And that's not just talking about when we pass on and when we die, but literally that we would be able to uh, live and dwell in his presence daily. So thank you so much, uh, Minister Joseph, for that word. And the, the next thing that Jesus spoke from the cross was him addressing his mother, Mary, and addressing John, who was um, called the disciple whom he loved. And I was tasked, my name is Martina Young, and I was tasked with talking about this third cry, this third declaration um, from the cross. And it, it, it comes from John 19. It says in verse 25, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour that disciple took her to his own home and there really is there's so much in um, this statement in this cry made by Jesus and first of all it's just uh when you when you think about that at this point that Jesus was in a uh, physical anguish that he was in pain that his soul was anguish that he was physically exhausted he had been beaten. He had been tortured. And yet in the midst of this, we see Jesus being concerned about the needs of his mother and being and, and, and making preparation for her. Because one of the things at that time, um, it's believed that at that point, Joseph um, had passed away. And so here Jesus was concerned about the needs of his mother. And sometimes in life, we can get so caught up with what we're going through that we will be blind to the pain of others. But we see Jesus, in spite of what he was going through, that he was still concerned about the needs of Mary. He was still stopping to provide for her, that he was still making sure that she was taken care of. And, and, and the picture of what he is doing for Mary is also the same that he does for us. It was basically like Jesus was saying that I will not leave you helpless and I will not leave you hopeless. So literally, and really even in, in, in her, in him asking John to be the one to care for his mother, that even was something like to give to John to say, this is, this was a, a, a precious, Mary was precious to Jesus because she was his mother. And to say, John, I am placing her in your care. In, in no situation, regardless of how ugly it looks, does God desire that we will feel like we are hopeless or helpless. 
regardless of what it looks like, there is still hope, there is still help, and he declares to us that help is on the way and that he will provide for us. We see Jesus on the cross manifesting Jehovah Jireh, our provider. We see him even in the midst of his pain still uh, uh, showing that he was a provider. And so that was one of the things we see that he was providing for for Mary and that he cared for John and that he knew that he could trust John. We should all have people in our lives that we know this is somebody that I can trust. And, and, and if, if when we find ourselves in places where we're challenged in that area, that's where we pray and ask God, send me, send, send to me the people in my life that you would have that I can trust and operate in that manner. And not only did Jesus show us a picture of provision, of, of being selfless, of being one that provides hope and help. Also, here in this scene, one of the things that grabbed my attention was when it says that Jesus saw her in verse 26, it opens up. It says, when Jesus therefore saw his mother, he saw her. Know that, that, that you're not unnoticed by God. You know, Jesus saw Mary standing there. He could have been so consumed in what he was going through that he didn't see her, but he saw her. And not only did he see Mary, the Lord is seeing us right now. Please know that you are not forgotten. Please know that you are not overlooked. Sometimes life and circumstances can leave you feeling like that nobody sees you and that nobody cares. But I want to guarantee to you today that God sees you. He knows where you are. And not only does he see you and know where you are, that he is making plan for your provision. Stay near him. Mary did not run away from Jesus' side. Mary and John and the others that were mentioned were there at the cross, even in his hardship. He stayed there. And so I encourage you that even when you're in a situation where it feels like your flesh is being crucified and your hopes and your desires and your dreams are being crucified, stay near the Lord. Stay near him. He sees you and is providing for you. And the other message that we can receive from this uh, cry and this word is when you think about it from Mary's perspective, you know, Jesus, though he was the son of God, he was still Mary's child. She's, yes, he was given to her by the Holy Spirit, but she still carried him in her womb. And for her to stand there, can you imagine the pain that she was going through as she looked at her child being crucified? It talks about that he had been beating to the point where he could not be distinguished. And so imagine the place of Mary standing there with her child, the, the, the child that she had birthed, the child that she had carried in her womb, there, beaten, bloody, in pain on the cross, and her not being able to do anything. And for those um, of you that have children, you know, you, you, you may be able to picture the anguish and the agony that that will cause. But even for others, what do you do in a situation where there's something that God has given you, that there's something that you have birthed out, that there's something that is precious to you, that there was a, that there was a vision or a dream that God put on the inside of your womb, and it looks like that that dream and that vision, that it is dying, that it looks like that promise, that it is passing away. What we want you to know today is that the favor of God will keep you even in situations like that. And I say that because when you go and you look at Luke 2, um, verses 34 through 35, this is when, um, when Jesus was a baby and they were in the temple. And, 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 and Simon comes and says to her that, the pain that Jesus was going to go through, she said, it said, he said, this is going to pierce even your uh, very soul. 
that you're, you're, you're going to feel this piercing. And when you think about that back in Luke 1 and verse 28, that's where the angel of the Lord came to Mary and said, blessed are you among women. You, you blessed and, and highly favored are you among women. And so here we see that the favor of God landed Mary in a painful situation. And sometimes in today's times, we get to thinking that the favor of God is all about prestige and houses and cars and money and land and different things like that. And God will bless us in a way in that nature. But when Mary was favored, that meant that God had, had picked it to her, that she picked her. He had selected her to be the one that would be able to carry the promise of the Messiah, that would be able to carry Jesus, knowing that even as God had favored her, that she would be able to walk through what she was required to walk through in order to participate in that purpose coming forth. Know that the favor of God, it is not always goosebumps and feeling great and, and just saying, hallelujah, I'm happy. There are times that we depend upon the favor of God because he will call you to walk through situations that would have crushed other people. But the thing about it is that when you have been favored by God, that means that he will also give you the grace to walk through. Because if you walk, if, as you continue through the word and you go and you look in, in the book of Acts, that we know that Mary continued to press on because when it talked about in that first chapter, um, in the first and second chapter, those who were gathered waiting um, uh, from the, for the promise of the Holy Spirit, that Mary was there. That meant that she did not allow what she saw, she did not allow what she experienced there at the cross to stop her from knowing the greatness of what God had placed on the inside of her. Let me tell you today that whatever the dream is, whatever the word is, there are some of you that are watching today that God made you a promise about one of your children, that there's a child that God told you would be great. And when you look at that child, it looks like they're walking in an opposite direction. There's somebody listening today that God gave you a vision about a business. He told you, he, he birthed that on the inside of you. And right now it may look like in the natural that that dream will never come to pass. But please know, sir and madam, that you have been favored by God. And though right now it may look like that dream, that promise, that baby, that gift, that is being crucified on the cross, know that the Lord is providing for you. Know that he will take care of you and that he will never leave you helpless and he will never leave you hopeless. You can depend on him. Just stay near the presence of the Lord and watch him speak and bring life out of what appears to be a dead situation. Behold. Behold, the Lord is still doing a great work in your life. Amen. Thank you. We thank you and pray that you will continue on with us now as we approach um, Jesus' fourth um, cry out from the cross in which he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And our sister, Pastor Karen Owens, is going to be joining us to share on that word. Listen in. I thank God for this opportunity. I thank God for Pastor, for Minister Martina Young. Right now, I'm going to jump right into the word and get my get my time in. I don't want to waste it. I want you all to come and go with me to Matthew's, amen, the 27th chapter. And I want to read uh, to you verse number 46. I will be speaking tonight on behalf of... Uh, on the seven sands, the last seven sands of Jesus on the cross. And mine is going to be uh, right here in this 46th verse of Matthew 27. Let us read it together. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, 
Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Amen. Amen. Let's ask, let's ask a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you bless the word. Bless the hearers and the doers of your word, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Speak to your servant and through me, Lord. Amen. Amen. By this time, Jesus had been hanging on the cross, the Bible says, uh, from the sixth to the ninth hour. And it is time. Darkness had fallen all over the land. And now here Jesus is in this ninth hour, just before his death, is, is hanging here on the cross. He had been through by this time a lot of pain and a lot of suffering and had suffered many things at the hands of the San Sanhedrin courts and, and all of those before. And that's just before he got on the way to the cross. So he has suffered a lot of things. But here he is crying out. Now he knows that death is inedible. There's no way that he's not going to see death as we know it on this cross. So here he is crying out to his father, crying out from his humanity, crying out even though we know that he is human and divine, he is still crying out in his flesh. And I, I think it's uh, interesting because we know that Jesus knew from the beginning of time what his purpose was for coming unto the earth. We know that by the word. Revelations 8, uh, 13 and 8 tells us that he was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Yet he cried out. If you read uh, St. John, when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he looked on him and said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Yet Jesus is still on the cross knowing all of these things. He's still crying out on the cross. If you read Titus 2 and 14, it says that he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify us unto himself, a peculiar people, zealous for good works. Yet we see that Jesus cried out. If you read Isaiah Glory to God. 53, 4B, it says, we see, we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. Verse number five in Isaiah 53 says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities and the chastisement of our peace was up on him by his stripes we were healed. My point is Jesus knew the purpose. He knew the plan, yet he cried out. He knew that the plan was for him to come and redeem man's sins. He knew that the blood, the only way for sin to be forgiven, the only way for sin to be completely annihilated would have to be the shedding of innocent blood. He was the lamb. Just like the lamb was the Passover in the days of Israel and Egypt, he was our Passover lamb. He knew that, yet he cried out. He knew his purpose. He knew the plan, but he still cried out. So to understand this, that, that he was crying out, we must recognize that Jesus was both human, hallelujah, and divine. We have not, the Bible says, a high priest that cannot be touched by our infirmities. He understands the pain that we go through. He understands the hardships of life. He understands how we can feel forsaken and how we can feel let down sometime and how we can feel like an outcast sometime. He understood that. He felt the pain of the cross, both as man and as a redeemer, because he understood as a redeemer that he had to go to the cross, that he had to allow them to put him on the cross, that he had to allow life to leave his physical body. But as a man, hallelujah, and as a as a man, as a human, he cried out because the pain was more than he could bear. Oh my God. So we thank God for Jesus Christ who died on the cross for us, knowing that he had the power. He cried out as a son who knew his father had the power to change his situation. I don't know about you, but I know I have cried out many times to my heavenly father, knowing that he had the power to change my current situation. 
in the name of Jesus. That's my little dog. Praise the Lord. But I understood because Jesus cried out. He letting us know that there are going to be times when we're going to cry out. He letting us know that showing, he's showing us by example that when we're walking for him and when we're walking for Christ, when we're living for God, there are going to be some times when you feel forsaken. Mm -hmm. There are going to be some times when you feel like all hope is gone. You, there are going to be some times when you feel like God has turned his back on you. You're going to be some times when you're going to look to the Lord and you're going to look to the heavens and you're going to say, Lord, I did everything that you told me to do. I followed the instructions that you gave me. I've been obedient to your word. I've been obedient to your will. And here I am doing all of these things. And your flesh is going to cry out because sometimes you're going to feel forsaken. You're going to say, Lord, it seems like the enemy is using me for target practice. They laughing at me. They mocking me. They scorning me, calling me all out of my name. There's going to be some time when you're going to feel like crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why am I going through this? Why so much pain? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I want to encourage you tonight that Jesus showed us the human side of suffering, the human side of suffering when you live in a life that is sold out to God. Hallelujah. But I want to encourage you tonight to look to Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and see what the writer says there. The writer there says, Hallelujah, that we must look, run this race with endurance that is set before us. The race may not be what we want it to be. It may not run. Sometimes the terrain is rugged. Sometimes we wish we could get out of the race. But the race, he says, we must run it with endurance. We must press on until the end. This race that is set before us, this Christian race, this ministry race, whatever the purpose is and the plan for God that God has for your life. And then he encourages us. And let me encourage you to look unto Jesus who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. Why? It says, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. Yes, we don't like the shame of the cross. We don't like the shame of being humiliated. We don't like the shame of being lied on and mistreated. We don't like the shame that the enemy will place on us. But the Bible says, hallelujah, that he has now been set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah. So I want to leave you with these words from Luke 9 and 23. What Jesus said to his disciples, if any man will follow me, come after me, let him take up his cross, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Hallelujah. So I want you to understand that if you feel like you are having a cross experience, if you feel like you're having a crucifixion experience, if you're feeling like you've been forsaken by God, let me tell you something. The cross, the hardship, the pain, it is not the end. It's just the beginning. Hallelujah. It's not the end. It's just the beginning. God is up to something and he will exalt you. The Bible says, humble yourself before God. Hallelujah. Before the mighty hand of God. And he will exalt you in due season. There is a season of suffering and pain. But I encourage you tonight, my sisters and my brother, to know that there is a season of exaltation. Your season is about to change. It changed for Jesus. Hallelujah. And it's going to change for all of those of us who have ever felt forsaken for doing the will of our Heavenly Father. Your season is about to change. You're not set out. You're not thrown out. You're not cast out. You've just been set up for a blessing, for victory. God bless you. Father. Thank you so much, Pastor Karen, for that word. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if we can be honest, 
uh, most of us, I know I have, I've walked in places where we have had that thought. So we just thank you for that powerful word. And I thank you all. Um, you know, along the way, we've run into some uh, technical hiccups, but we keep rolling on because we want to get the meat of the word and, and the messages um, that our sisters are sharing today. And so our next um, cry and declaration that we are sharing is um, when Jesus was on the cross and he said, I thirst. So his fifth cry out was our thirst. And we have two sisters that are going to share um, their conversation about Jesus saying, I thirst. So we pray that you listen in and that you receive from I thirst. And those two sisters are, I almost forgot to say their names. <laughs> um, it's Minister Shanika Thomas and um, Natasha Marshall. So thank you ladies so much for sharing with us today. And we're ready to hear what you have to say about I Thirst. Thirst You for Something podcast. Um, coming from, we are reviewing the book today of John 1928, I Thirst. And? Everybody's thirsty for something. Hashtag. I like the way you, the way you flow. <laughs> so we are reviewing today, um, talking about the last, um, last words of Jesus. So in those last words, before his death, Jesus was talking about um, how he, how he thirsted. He was human, his human form. Um, when he died on the cross, him being as human as we were. Some of those points in that John 19 to 28 that stood out to us as we were reviewing that book we're going to talk about because like I said we everybody's thirsty for something so it's just about what are you thirsting for and where are you what are you using to quench that thirst so we look to Jesus for a reference right Shanika and I so we're going to talk about that today and we're going to make that plain for us so Jesus as we look to him for our example why is this important because on that cross there Jesus he actually displayed to us that he did deal with struggle. He dealt with struggle. He dealt with hardship. He dealt with death. He actually wrestled with death. Um, and really what that meant stood out to us as we reviewed that book, or stood out to myself, Shanika. Um, I saw that Jesus could be human, right? So then I want to talk about that book. What do you think about that, Shanika? What about Jesus actually being human right there on the cross? I mean, well, in reading, you know, I thirst or whatever, obviously the human uh -huh. part of him was thirsting, but um, I had looked. And so, you know how sometimes there's a word in the Bible and it's mentioned several times, but not, it doesn't mean the same thing every time it's mentioned, like the word praise. There are like seven other meanings for one word praise or whatever. So I tried to look and see if thirst meant thirst every right. single time and thirst is thirst. Like there were no alternative definitions or anything. So the thing that I saw, it said um, to suffer thirst, uh -huh. painfully feel their want or eagerly long for those things by which the soul is refreshed, supported and strengthened. So like, even though while at that moment in Jesus humanity, he was like, you know, I thirst, uh -huh. our souls thirst. And at I'm that like time, honestly, he yeah. had taken on him all of the iniquity of mankind. Yeah. So while physically he was thirsty, there yeah. was also a thirst in his soul. Yeah. Because he was bearing everything, you know what I'm saying, that humanity, you know, had waited on him or whatever. Definitely. And something that I had seen, so I was like jumping around, trying to like make sure or read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so Jesus actually refused drink the first time he was offered. So in Matthew and Mark, if you go and look, um, it says that they offered it, they offered him um, a drink and it was like with wine. One says with wine and gall, another says with uh, wine and myrrh. But mm -hmm. he said, no, he ain't want it. I ain't gonna That's say he right. didn't know, he, he refused it. So it kind of got me to thinking like sometimes well, it actually takes until we're thirsty. Like we get real picky. Like 
whether whether we're eating or whatever, it's kind of like, no, I don't, I don't want to drink that right now. I don't need that right now. And for me, when Jesus refused the first time, it was just kind of like, I don't, I don't need that. And the, the thing is that drink that was offered was meant to sedate. Yeah. And I was just like, dude, how many times do we take things? Hmm. We allow things to sedate us from Come the on things now. that we're dealing with in our life. How many times do we just, yep, I'm going to take it because I need something to numb me for a little bit. For but right now. Do that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it's so, uh, that is so true and it's so imperative, right? How many times do we take something instead of waiting on and trusting what God has for us, right? right. Um, how many times do we take something oh. for that temporary fix, not knowing that that's doing us irreparable damage, right? Um, and that, 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 that that you were talking about, him drinking that wine vinegar, that actually was a fulfillment of prophecy, right? So some scholars believe that that was a fulfillment, that was an actual fulfillment of prophecy. So what does that mean to us, right? So there's several things that that, that, that means to us. So him drinking that vinegar, them giving him that wine vinegar um, that was associated with him being fatigued, right? So when I was searching and I was looking at that and I was meditating on that, because even that portion of that scripture, um, that was so rich in so many different ways for so many different things. Um, so it's like, okay, Jesus. So the first thing was, is that it refers back to Psalm 69, 21. And so the fatigue that which Jesus had, had that Jesus actually had undergone, the grief that he had felt, right? Um, the heat of the day that it happened, because all of this was strategic, right? So nothing that God has us to go through is any happenstance. So the fatigue, the heat of the day, the amount, the sheer amount and the loss of blood that he had gone and he had experienced at that time, all of these led to the amount and um, and the sheer de desire of him saying, I thirst, the natural, physical and spiritual causes of the actual thirst. Um, and so it's like Jesus, he could have born, you know, out of his sheer strength, right? Um, actually, the actual complaint of any single one of those, right? But all of those things together, right? So like you said, initially he was able to, in his mere strength, right? He hadn't lost as much blood. Maybe the heat of the day wasn't as high. Um, he hadn't been as fatigued, right? And then they had masked it with something in the um, at the second part of the day where the actual stench of that actual wine vinegar was not as strong. Um, so in other words, what does that say to us? It says to us that the enemy learns us, right? And the enemy comes back stronger the second time and he is more conniving. He learns our likes and our dislikes. And so it's like, so the first time where he was able to withstand, the second time, you know, he, it was a little, the enemy made it more pleasing to him as he does to us, right? And so then in the midst of the struggle and even with that being the fulfillment of prophecy, um, when Jesus was like, and that scripture where it says they put gall in my food and that um, and that uh, also with that, it's like, OK, hold on, God. What is that saying to me? Because we have to look to Jesus. Right. As our example. And so it's like, OK, hold on. If this Psalm 69, 21 was a fulfillment of prophecy, then that means that God actually orchestrated everything that happened. God orchestrated that. For, for them to come back the second time, God orchestrated for Jesus to be thirsty, and that that had to that had to happen that way. That had to happen for Jesus to be stretched. And if God did it for Jesus, then He would do it for us. So in the times of us being stretching, and the time for us to being in our dry places, then guess what? We can all refer and look to the example of Jesus in Philippians one and six for us to be encouraged for the days to come. What do you think about that, Shanika? Well, I think. Just like God orchestrated, you know, everything leading up to Jesus and even after, he also orchestrates for us to not be thirsty. Because, I mean, we have scripture that says, uh, what is it, Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for yeah. they will be filled. Yeah. Um, we've got, what is it, John, hold on, babes. Wait a minute, we've got John 6, 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. And whoever uh, believes in me will never be thirsty. So like 
we hear references <laughs> and we read references about how God wants to quench our thirst ultimately. And let's be honest, what like when we're naturally thirsty, like and we go for the 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 a pop and the, the Gatorade or whatever it is, we're still, you know what I'm saying, a little thirsty. We, we got to drink more because it's not really quenching the thirst. And the thing is, so when Jesus, when Jesus did take the drink, when he said, I thirst, what they gave him really was a thirst quencher. It wasn't the best smelling thing. It was bitter, but it did what it was supposed to do. And sometimes we have to take some of that bitter to get our thirst, our thirst quench. And yeah. like a lot of people are like, they don't like water, but it's yeah. the best thing for you. Yeah. That's the thing that's going to quench your thirst. And in the same way in our lives, we're looking at all these other things. We, we want to um, invest our time in movies and in people and in shopping and in food yeah. and everything else, because we're trying to fulfill something. But the only thing that's going to fulfill it is yeah. the spirit of God. Yeah. And, you know, I promise you, you are right in there. And I like the way that you flow. Hashtag, I like the way that you flow. Okay. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because we, because the world and marketing is, if you're right in my lane, you know, because the world and marketing is meant to push us into the sugary drinks and into the Gatorades and stuff like that. But it's funny because, all of our blood is made up of 98% water. So even right. though we will go to those other things, right, um, that may seem like a good temporary fix, but it's only designed to make you be even more thirsty. It has more fructose in it. It has more stuff that's going to break down and make you and send you to actually be what more thirsty. When if right. we go to the thing that God made that come made to the in the earth, right, the water, the H2O, the thing that we say. <laughs> Okay. All right. So we are. All righty. And you know what our ladies did? Thank you so much for them for with their uh, conversation with us. Um, they were sharing their conversation on our thirst. And one of the things that happened with them, and as you see, it literally was just them having a conversation about being thirsty. Um, having an informal conversation because we we want this to be everyday life um, application. Yes, it, 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 a, a hoop and a holler is all well and good, but we're coming with everyday, um, just everyday life. And so these ladies, they want to come back and share a little more with us about being Thursday. So uh, continue to listen in as Shanika and Natasha share with us a, a few more moments in their conversation about I Thirst. Some moments and points of reflection. Um, and also some scriptures to refer to as well. Um, in your study time, please refer to Philippians 1 and 16, um, Psalms 22, 15, Matthew 27, 48, and 27, 50. Mark 15, 36 and 15, 37, as well as Luke 23, 36. And just as, as we were, as, just as I was studying and as I, as I was reviewing this um, about thirsting and God being, and Jesus actually saying that he thirsted, um, just took me actually to him visiting the woman at the well and, um, and actually me being the woman at the well sometimes. And how God is so concerned about each one of us that he will meet us at our season of the dry place, whatever your dry place is, and that your season of stretching. But he comes to you at your personal time, your personal time. It can be at the heat of the day. It can be when you're in a crowded room. It doesn't matter where you are. You can be in a crowded room surrounded by everybody and that God models this for us that even in the midst of the suffering where God, where Jesus was like this struggle, it was his darkest hour in the midst of the pain. But even in the midst of that pain, his pain and his suffering where he said, yet not my will, but Father, thou will be done. And his pain turned into worship. And so much for me so, right, is that in the reflection of my daughter, 
what a lot of you may or may not know is that just a couple of months ago, my daughter died. And so um, when I was praying in the midst of my prayer, God didn't even allow me to get it out. So I was praying to him and I was praying and pleading and travailing in prayer. God, if it be thy will to save my daughter. And in the midst of my prayer, God told me, I'm going to take your daughter. I'm going to take um, Nariah. And so in the midst of my prayer and my pain, it turned into praise. And so I'm not ready to sit here and put on a facade. Y'all who know me know I don't do facades, right? Um, but what I can say is that with the model of my father, that there on that plane, my pain, in the midst of my pain and my suffering, it did turn into praise. And not because I'm putting on no show, but because it has to do with relationship. And so, yes, I thirst, right? Even then I thirsted. God know that I needed an answer. Not then, not there right then in a continual answer. And because of relationship, because he knows what each one of his children needs, he supplies it no matter where we are. And because of that, I can, and I continue to go on in authenticity, not for facade, but because of the model of what my father continues to give to each one of us. So what I will say is that I will continue to follow the model of my father, right? The model that God is the only withstanding one that will never, ever change, right? I can count on him. And so that is what I will follow him because he is my solid rock. Amen. And so while, while I was going through and looking at different scriptures and things, um, something was brought back to me. So there was a point in time when I was, uh, I guess, a little frustrated with God. And so... I was kind of like, you don't know what it's like, you know, you don't know what it's like to, you know, not be able to see, think you're going blind. And um, God in his way <laughs> directed me <laughs> to the scripture where it was leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. And there's a part in there where they blindfolded Jesus and they were like, prophesy who hit you kind of thing. And it was, a, it was kind of a big crunch for me because I was just like, okay. So for me in this um, with Jesus and um, some of his last words being, I thirst, um, it brought to me Hebrews um, 4 and 15. For we have not a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So whatever you're thirsting for, whatever is trying to call your attention, make sure that you are using God, the spirit of God to quench that thirst, because that is the only thing. God is the only one that can satisfy any need, any desire, anything in your life. That's all I got. That's enough. That's more than enough. That's more than enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's been our pleasure to co-teach and study with you. Bye-bye, baby. I love you. We just want to leave you with these with these closing thoughts. What are you modeling before people? What, what's going out of your belly? Not when you're on stage, but when you're in your bed, when you're in your hall, your bathroom, your car. May we all be reminded today and in the days to come in our seasons of struggle. Um, to turn to God like Jesus did for he is a solid rock. So, we love you ladies. Thank you for the uh, option, Martina. See you later. All right, ladies. Thank you so much for sharing that. We appreciate it. And again, um, and, and thank you for the 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 uh, add-ins of our babies. But um, really just it, it that touch my heart. I know that you all were having um, a conversation, but in the midst of your uh, conversation, it, it really truly did minister just about that in life we can find ourselves in thirsty places. And that is so important that we take our thirst back to God. And um, Natasha, in your transparency about um, going through um, you know, with the passing of your daughter and you continue to stand strong, um, 
both you all, you all have ministered to us about real life places. Um, Janika, you continue to, to share the word, even balancing uh, a motherhood and still uh, seeking to do the things that God um, has called you to do. And so I, I know I keep saying this, but we really want you all to understand that what we're coming with today is, uh, is literally just trying to touch the hearts of God's people and encourage you to know that God is right there in your home with you. We don't have to wait until we get into um, a, a building and different things like that, that God will meet you and that thirst right there in your home. And in this past year, we've had to walk through situations that have left us thirsty and striving. And we need to know that I don't, I don't have to wait on um, the world-class evangelist to, to uh, give me a word. Like literally, we need to know that God is right here and he desires to minister to our hearts. And so we just thank you. We, we're, we're drawing close to his last words. Um, hopefully I'll be able to make it through without having a, a full cry party. But we are continuing on. Um, to our next word, and it is the sixth thing that Jesus spoke and cried from the cross. And those words were, it is finished. And our sister, uh, Minister Dina Boone Jones, is going to come and share with us about it is finished. Thank you. I wanted to talk to you a few minutes about what I believe when Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, what that meant. But first, I want to go over a few scriptures with you regarding Jesus so you can see how I have come up to that conclusion. Let's look at Ephesians 1 through 7. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Romans 5 9 says, much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Then John 3.16 tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whomsoever believeth in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Hebrews 10, 19-20. Now this shows us where Jesus prepared the way that we can have access, open door access to the Father. It says, For therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter to the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Now, John 10, 10 tells us, the thief cometh not to come up, but to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I come that you may have life, and you have that life more abundantly. Then Isaiah 53, 4 to 5, it talks about that. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we were healed. So looking at those scriptures, I'm gonna sum it up with my one of my favorite scriptures, Galatians 3, 13 through 16. It tells us that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. By becoming a curse for us, for it is written, curses everyone who hung upon a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So, to me, that sums it up right there that he came and redeemed us from the curse. So, this is part of what I call my salvation packet. For death, he's given me eternal life. For sickness, he's provided health. Poverty, he's given me wealth and total access through the Father, through his blood. So that's what I believe what Jesus meant when he said it is finished, that those things were accomplished, it was done. And now we have those things through access, through him, through his blood. 
Amen. Thank you so much, Dina. Um, it is finished. It is finished. Healing finished. Poverty finished. Can you say that to yourself? It is finished. It might not look like it right now, but we're standing on the fact that it is finished. Amen. And the last words that Jesus spoke on the cross were, Father, into your hands I commit, or it may even say, I commend my spirit. And our sister, Minister Ebony Thompson, is going to join us to share from Jesus' final words that he spoke while he was on the cross. Thank you. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Or the version I like, which is the message version of Luke 23 and 46. It says, Father, I place my life in your hands. Now, these are the last audible words of Jesus before he took his last breath. And when I see it and when I hear it and I think about it, I'm like, okay, so when we're younger, we place our lives in the hands of our parents. When we get a little older, we place our secrets and our, and our joy and all of that into the hands, that part of our lives into the hands of our friends. When we're in trouble, we place our lives in the hands of lawyers and judges. And when we're sick, we place our hands in the lives of, I mean, in the hands of nurses and doctors. So why do we wait until we are physically like Jesus dying before we place our hands in the lives of the Father? See, when you think about that, it was like, yeah, you get it. No, 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 no. God gives us life. He is the giver of life. Not just physical life, but spiritual life. Um, and so why do we wait so long until we're in trouble or until we're looking death in the face to say, God, I give you my life. I place my life in your hands. And a lot of times when we get to that point, we, you know, he saves us, he heals us, he does all of this stuff. And then we, we back off and we go about living our life. When God wants us, he, he sent Jesus to what? Die for our sins. He sent Jesus so that we could live a life with him. He sent Jesus. He sent his only begotten son so that we could get it in our heads and click it in our hearts. So that we could give him our lives and place our lives in his hands, just like his son. So today, as we go about Remember that when you wake up and you take a breath, that's God. When you place your feet on the ground and you could feel your floor, you could feel the solid foundation, that's God. When you can go outside and you feel that cool breeze on your face, that's God. When you can click those lights on, that's God. When you feel that internal joy inside of you, and even if all hell is breaking loose, even in the midst of a pandemic, and you still have it all, and you have your right mind, that is God. So if you can trust him to heal you momentarily, if you can trust him to you know, for your financial blessings or to place you on a platform and all of these other things that we go to God for, the materialistic stuff and all the other stuff that we tend to go to God for, why don't you trust him to give him your life wholeheartedly? Because he wants you. He wants you. He loves you. And he's waiting on you. So just like Jesus, when he said, Father, 
right now, Father, I place my life in your hands. Why don't you say that? Stick to it and live it out. Is every day going to be peaches and cream? No. But I'm telling you, at the end of the day, it is so worth it. Love on God. Allow God to love on you and place your life in his hands. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Ebony, for that reminder about placing our lives in the hand of the Father and knowing that Jesus, what better hands can we entrust our lives to than to say, God, into your hands, into your hands, I commend my spirit because literally, Lord, really my life is already in your hands. And so our prayer is that you take that as a reminder that even in difficult times, that one of the things that we can trust in is that Father, in your hands, my life is in your hands. My times are in your hands. And sometimes we can get discouraged by the things that we see and we feel, but we have to remind ourselves that we are in the hands of God. And as we prepare to close out, you know, one of the things that always gets me when we get to the end of the last word that Jesus spoke is that earlier we have him in the, the, the fourth uh, utterance from the cross was, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then we get to these final words and he says, Father. And see, this is a reminder about relationship that as we have relationship with our heavenly father, that there's no greater hands that we can be in than his. And so we thank you all um, for joining and listening in. And before we close out, we want to share with you that we know that often it's referred to as Good Friday, but Jesus literally went through agony and pain. He was beat. They put a crown of thorns on his head. They took his clothes. He suffered. He sacrificed. And the thing about it is that he did that all for you and for me. And in the midst of it, as he was commending his life into the hands of his father, whom his life already belonged to, he knew, we know, that Sunday is coming. And so our sister, Dr. Michelle Page Lloyd, Lloyd Page, don't get me. <laughs> Dr. Michelle Lloyd Page is going to share words with us, words of hope about Sunday is coming. Listen in as we prepare to close out. Hello, I'm Michelle Lloyd Page, and on this Good Friday, I'd like to share with you a reading. Actually, it's a meditation by pastor, the pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in San Diego, California. At least he was the pastor until 1993. His name is S.M. Lockridge. It's a powerful statement, and there's no need to improve on perfection. So allow me to read this meditation called Sunday is Coming. It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter is sleeping. Judas is betraying. But Sunday is coming. It's Friday. Pilate struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying, Peter's denying, but they don't know Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scarlet. They crown him with thorns, but they don't know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. 
See my Jesus walk into Calvary, his blood dripping, his body stumbling, and his spirit burdened. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning and evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nail my Savior's hands to the cross. They nail my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raise him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know. It's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday. But Sunday's? Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The earth trembles. The sky grows dark. My king yields his spirit. It's Friday. Hope is lost. Death has won. Sin has conquered. And Satan just a laughing. It's Friday. Jesus is buried. A guard stands at the tomb. A rock is rolled in place. But it's Friday. It's only Friday. Sunday is a coming. Amen. Amen. Sunday is coming. I know that on Friday, things look bad. It was dark, but God wants us to know that Sunday is coming. It makes me think about the song that says, but that's not how the story ends. Three days later, he rose again. That's love. It says they hung him high. <laughs> they stretched him wide. He hung his head. For me, he died. That's love. But the story didn't end there. Sunday is coming. It does not matter how dark it may look right now or what you may be facing right now. Know that Sunday is coming. We thank you all so much for joining in with us today as we looked at um, Jesus' words from the cross. As I said, our goal was to bring it down to everyday life. Thank you to all of my uh, beautiful and wonderful sisters that joined me literally from um, across the United States to um, just to share. As I mentioned, some were conversations, some were sermons, and really the goal is just to know that our everyday Jesus is here with us every day. So whatever, whatever circumstance or situation you may find yourself in today, know that Christ is there. That when we look at and we talk about his declarations from the cross, these were the final words that he spoke from the cross, but these were not the final words that he spoke. Why? Because he was resurrected, because he came in power. And that same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead so that he was able to speak on is the same power that we have access to in our lives today. So our prayer is that in the midst of what has been shared, that there have been things that you will be able to take and apply to your life on a daily basis. That even mother, as you're there raising your little children, know that Christ is there. For you, brother, even as you're uh, uh, maybe in a challenging situation on your job, know that Christ is there. Sister, you may be confronting a situation where you're running into one glass ceiling after another. 
where you're dealing with conflict on your job, know that Christ is there. And in the midst of it, he is teaching us to walk by faith and not by sight. And I say that because the sight of what we what was seen on his final uh, hours on the cross looked dark and dim, but faith, but faith tells a whole different story. And so we thank you and we close out with these parting words, which are found in 1 Corinthians chapter one, I'm starting at verse 18. It says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. It sounds foolish to talk about that our salvation, that our deliverance, that our life came through Christ's death. But God shows us over and over again that the things that may appear to be foolish to man are that God is working in the midst. It may not make sense what you're seeing in the natural, but know that we have a supernatural God who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to his power that is at work in us. And that power that we have access to, that power that is at work in us is the power that Christ gave us access to as he sacrificed his life and hung on the cross, but refused to stay there. Because as it says in um, the second chapter of Acts, I believe it's the 19th verse, that it was impossible for death to keep him. Know that whatever it is today that you're facing, that there's nothing impossible for God. So we thank you. We thank all the beautiful ladies that joined in to share. And we thank you, uh, brothers and sisters, that have taken the time to watch with us. God bless you. Until next time, sister to sister, signing out. We love you. Bye-bye.